Okay, this chapter is dealing with the chemical properties of metals. We have already talked about physical properties of metals when we were talking about uh, giant macromolecular structures in the chapter on chemical bonding. And we said if we're trying to describe the structure of metals, metals have giant three-dimensional structure in which we have regular rows of positive ions surrounded by a sea of free moving electrons. We said metals have one or two or three electrons in their outer shell. They don't really want it. So these electrons are sort of floating around each atom. So the atom now is not really an atom. It's a positive ion because some of its electrons are floating slightly away from it. So this is a solid. So it is regular rows, but it's not atoms. It's positive ions and it is surrounded by free moving electrons, which we call delocalized electrons. As such, what are the physical properties of all metals? Remember, if he says all metals, we say all metals conduct electricity. All metals are malleable and ductile. All metals are shiny. We do not say all metals have high melting point, for example, because that is variable between the different metals. But these are the properties that apply to all metals, whatever metal we're talking about. And we said metals conduct electricity because they have free moving electrons. Remember, ionic compounds conduct electricity because they have free moving ions. But metals and graphite conduct electricity due to free moving electrons. Now, we said all metals are malleable and ductile. This is because the layers of positive ions can slide over each other when heated or hammered. All metals are shiny. So these are the physical properties. So this is a typical uh, question. Explain why the magnesium metal is malleable and a good conductor of electricity. We said, why is it malleable and good conductor of electricity? Well, it's a good conductor of electricity because of the presence of free moving or delocalized electrons. It is malleable because the layers of positive ions can slide over each other when heated or hammered. Remember, this is the kind of answer that you're expected to give. Okay, if we talk about the chemical reactions of metals, then we need to be familiar with what we call chemical reactivity series. Already you should know from our study of the periodic table, we said any metal in group one is more reactive than group two, more reactive than group three, more reactive than transition. So something like sodium would be more reactive than magnesium, more reactive than aluminium, and the aluminium is more reactive than the transition metals. Uh, within the same group, which one is more reactive? For example, in group one, which one would be more reactive, sodium or potassium? We said the one below is more reactive. So the potassium is more reactive than the sodium, and that is why we put them on top. Then in group two, in group two, calcium is more reactive than magnesium, and then group three, aluminium, and then the transition metals. So the chemical reactivity series is really an arrangement of the metals according to their reactivity, but it includes the metals that are used a lot. Okay, so we don't include something like cesium because cesium is too reactive and we don't use it in any reactions anyway. So the metals that are included in the chemical reactivity series are the ones that you will see reactions for. Okay, remember that the potassium is the more reactive in that list, and that means anything as we go down is less and less reactive. Okay, so what are the reactions that we want to talk about? Reaction of metal with oxygen. You know that all metals will burn in oxygen and what is formed is called an oxide. So sodium, for example, reacts with oxygen or burns in oxygen to give sodium oxide. And please be familiar with the balancing of any equation. Remember that when you're asked to write a simple equation, that means he says, write an equation that means it has to be simple, it has to be balanced. If he says write a word equation, then it's just words and of course we don't balance any words. Okay, magnesium in oxygen. So if we burn magnesium in oxygen, that gives what we call magnesium oxide. And you should realize that when magnesium burns, it burns with a bright flame and the magnesium oxide that is formed is a white solid or sometimes we call it white ash. So you should be familiar with the word observation, first of all. So if he says, what is the observation when magnesium burns in 
uh, air or burns in oxygen don't just say magnesium oxide that's not an observation that's a product the observation is the magnesium will burn with a bright flame and a white solid is formed which is magnesium oxide the metal oxides are basic and we know they are basic because when they dissolve in water they form alkaline solutions that will turn litmus paper to what to blue okay so something like sodium oxide you dissolve it in water it forms sodium hydroxide remember that some oxides are not soluble in water they're still basic but they're not soluble in water now some of the metals we talked about the amphoteric we said some of the metals form amphoteric oxide so which metals did we say form amphoteric oxides we said aluminium lead and zinc so the oxide of aluminium and lead and zinc are amphoteric now what does amphoteric mean amphoteric means they will react with acid and they will react with base to form salts and water so if you have something like aluminium oxide it will react with hcl so in that case it's acting as a base so it forms aluminium chloride plus water but it will also react with base so in this case it's acting as an acid so notice what is formed when aluminium oxide reacts with sodium hydroxide it forms something called sodium aluminate which is NaAlO2 and that is the salt plus water so a typical question a student uses this apparatus to find the mass of magnesium oxide that forms when a strip of magnesium ribbon is burned in air so he has magnesium inside that crucible and remember that this apparatus is called crucible and lid describe the appearance of the freshly cleaned magnesium ribbon and the appearance of the magnesium oxide as magnesium as a magnesium metal what is the appearance of a metal appearance of a metal is silvery or silvery gray magnesium oxide that is formed we said what is the appearance of the magnesium oxide we said that's a white solid or you could say white ash explain why the student lifts the lid and quickly replaces it several times during the experiment what is he trying to cause the magnesium to react with we want the magnesium to react with oxygen now if i keep the lid closed at some point we're going to run out of oxygen so the lid has to be lifted from time to time to allow more oxygen to react with the magnesium and then why do i need to replace it why not just leave it without a cover to allow more oxygen in i need to replace the lid to prevent loss of the product from the crucible because as the magnesium burns it forms a white solid that is in the form of ash and that ash can be lost from the crucible if it is not covered so this is one of the questions at the end of paper six it says uh, calcium burns in air to form calcium oxide the reaction is vigorous and some of the calcium oxide can be lost as smoke plan an investigation to determine the maximum mass of oxygen that combines to form calcium oxide when two grams of calcium granules are burnt in air so first of all we're trying to react calcium with oxygen to form calcium oxide and we want to know how much oxygen was used well which apparatus do we use we use the crucible and the lid and we put the calcium inside the crucible before that we need to weigh it so we put two grams of the calcium into the crucible and lid and weigh using a balance now cover the crucible and heat it when we heat it we said this calcium reacts with the oxygen now cover the crucible oh sorry remove the cover several times we said why do we do that to allow more air in and then after that when we think that the reaction has finished we leave it to cool and reweigh we cannot weigh it when it is hot so we leave it to cool and reweigh with everything that we started with so if we weighed it at the beginning with the lid we have to weigh it again with the lid but that's not the end of it how do i know if the reaction has finished i keep reheating and reweighing until the mass does not change so we say reheat and reweigh several times until constant mass now once the mass does remember if the calcium reacts with oxygen what will be happening to the mass the mass will be increasing because I, I had calcium at the beginning now i have calcium oxide which is calcium with oxygen and that means that the mass will keep on increasing until all the calcium has reacted then the mass will not increase anymore so that is what we call constant mass now how do we know the mass of oxygen well 
if we subtract the final mass minus the original mass then that is the mass of the oxygen so it is the, the initial mass of crucible and lead and calcium is subtracted from the final mass to obtain mass of oxygen used okay okay let's talk so that was reaction with oxygen let's talk about reaction with water we're going to say that in the reactivity series some metals react with cold water and some react with steam at the top of the electrochemical series do you remember what was the electrochemical series kanaka magal zinc iron tin and then hydrogen so reaction of sodium potassium sodium calcium k n e c a these react with cold water now from magnesium to anything above hydrogen it will react with steam so when we put sodium in cold water you should know that if a metal reacts with cold water then this the hydroxide is formed so sodium plus cold water will give sodium hydroxide plus which gas hydrogen gas so remember that when we put sodium in water what happens is hydrogen gas is formed and sodium hydroxide solution so if i say what are the observations first of all you should realize that metals in group one have low density compared to the other metals so they actually float on the water so sodium or potassium would float on the water now when it floats on the water it is reacting to give hydrogen gas so there are bubbles of gas everywhere now the bubbles of gas push the sodium around so it's not it is not just sitting at the top of the water doing nothing no it's actually moving around the water because the bubbles of hydrogen gas that are being formed is pushing it around and then at some point it will all react so it will all melt or it will all disappear so we say the first observation is sodium floats darts melts then because sodium is a reactive metal we're going to have vigorous fizzing so we have a lot of bubbles of gas coming out then the bubbles of gas because this is on the surface of the water the hydrogen gas is flammable it will catch fire if we have a third one so if he says give three observations the main three observations are sodium floats dark smells vigorous fizzing or bubbles of gas and the bubbles of gas may catch fire now if he wants a fourth one then we're going to say that the solution formed will turn litmus paper to blue because the solution has sodium hydroxide in it which is a base right okay so a typical question a teacher investigates the reaction between sodium and water the teacher fills a trough with water remember that uh, a wide beaker like this is called a trough she adds a few drops of litmus solution to the water and then adds a piece of sodium the sodium floats on the water so he already tells me the part of floats it reacts with water and forms bubbles of hydrogen gas so he's already telling me that there are bubbles of gas then he says the two other observations remember when he says two other you do not repeat again the observations that he said so we cannot say sodium floats again or we cannot say bubbles of gas again so we need to give two other observations that sodium darts and melts and he uh, mentions that the she added litmus solution so the litmus solution will turn blue okay balance the equation do you remember the balancing if we balance uh, okay, he says include state symbols first. So you know that sodium is a metal, so that's a solid. Water is a liquid. Sodium hydroxide is aqueous. Remember that something that is dissolved in water is aqueous, it's not a liquid. And hydrogen is a gas. Now we need to balance. So let's see. <clears throat> one sodium before the arrow, one sodium after the arrow. Uh, two hydrogens before the arrow how many hydrogens after the arrow i have one in the sodium hydroxide and two alone so i have three after the arrow so i need to balance um, we need to put two in front of the uh, sodium hydroxide and two in front of the water in that case we will have four hydrogens now we have what and we have balanced the oxygens but we need to balance the sodium okay lithium and potassium react in a similar way to sodium when added to water state why they have a similar reaction in terms of electronic configuration so he's saying lithium sodium potassium they all react in the same way why because they all have one electron outer shell remember don't say because they're all in group one because he's saying in terms of electronic configuration 
So they all have one electron in the outer shell. Place the elements in order of reactivity. Remember that we said if we look at the periodic table, the one down is more reactive than the one up. So potassium will be more reactive than sodium, more reactive than lithium. Okay? Now, calcium, remember in the electrochemical series, we said which ones react with cold water? Everything in group 1, so potassium and sodium, and calcium in group 2. So, calcium reacts, and calcium, so if calcium reacts with cold water, then anything below calcium, which is supposed to be more reactive, will also react with cold water. So, something like barium below calcium in the periodic table will also react with cold water. Anyway, so now calcium is in group 2, so it is not a low uh, density metal so it is heavy this in this case the calcium will sink remember that when any metal reacts with cold water it forms the hydroxide plus hydrogen so I will still see bubbles of gas so my observations would be that the calcium sinks the other when we're talking about sodium we said it floats um, strong fizzing or bubbles of gas and the solution becomes milky because the calcium hydroxide formed is not soluble in water so when it forms calcium hydroxide calcium hydroxide is not very soluble in water so we start to see that the solution becomes cloudy or milky okay now starting from magnesium down to any metal before the uh, hydrogen the electrochemical series any metal more reactive than hydrogen will react with steam so magnesium, when a metal reacts with steam, now it doesn't give the hydroxide, it gives the oxide. So magnesium plus steam. Steam means water at a very high temperature. So that means that I can put it in this tube and we put the magnesium. And if I want to pass steam over the magnesium, how can I do that? I can put a cotton wool soaked in water and heat the water then the water will become steam pass over the magnesium and the magnesium will start to burn with a bright flame it will form magnesium oxide and remember we said magnesium oxide is a white solid and the hydrogen gas that is formed will burn at the end of the tube so these are observations when we put magnesium in or when we react magnesium with steam the same happens with zinc because zinc is less reactive than magnesium so it still will react only with steam and we said when they react with steam they form zinc oxide now this is an uh, another question where it says plan an investigation to show the order of reactivity of three metals so i have tin zinc and silver and i want to know which one is more reactive remember that we said if we're trying to compare we can react them for example with an acid each of them will give hydrogen gas. The one that is more reactive will give more gas in a specific time. So that's what we should do to compare them. Of course, we could just put them into beakers and see which one gives bubbles and which one does not. But then it is more difficult to determine how many bubbles are formed. So counting bubbles is not a good idea. Putting it into something like this would be much better. So. First of all, when you're comparing between three metals, then you should use the same mass of the metal. So you have to specify that we're using a specific mass of the first metal and we weigh it using a balance. Put into a conical flask, connect it to a gas syringe. Now you're going to add a specific amount of acid. So let's say 25 centimeter cubed of dilute hydrochloric acid to the flask. We usually do that using a dropping funnel. Determine the volume of gas collected in a specific amount of time because we're going to compare them so let's say we're going to leave it for five minutes and see how much gas or one minute if you want so determine the volume of gas collected in one minute repeat using five grams of each of the other metals and the same volume of each cell remember that when you say you repeat with the other metals you have to tell me what we are keeping constant we're keeping the mass of the metals constant and the same volume of hcl that gives more gas in five minutes is more reactive okay okay the next thing we're talking about is reaction of metals with acid so let's just say we have an acid like hydrochloric acid now remember that in the electrochemical series any metals above hydrogen will react with acids any metals below hydrogen will not react with 
acids and when they react with acids they give salt plus what plus hydrogen now the how vigorous the reaction is is an indication of uh, which metal is more reactive so if i put magnesium magnesium is more reactive it gives a lot of bubbles if i put zinc it gives less bubbles and remember that copper is below hydrogen in the electrochemical series it will not react with acid and will not react with water okay copper does not react with acid so i cannot say copper plus hydrochloric acid and it does not react with water why because it is less reactive than hydrogen okay so let's see let's take a look at these questions give two observations that are made when a piece of magnesium ribbon is added to acid what do you think you will see when you put a piece of magnesium in acid first of all we said it will react to give a gas so it should give bubbles of gas but what is the other observation the fact that the piece of magnesium which is a solid will start to disappear or start to dissolve magnesium is a reactive metal its reactivity can be seen in its reactions with oxygen and acid in reaction one so he has reaction one magnesium with oxygen some magnesium is ignited and then placed in a jar of oxygen gas what is the observation when i react magnesium with oxygen we said magnesium burns with a bright flame and a white solid is formed which is the magnesium oxide right okay the next reaction is displacement reactions and displacement reactions are reactions in which the more reactive metal will push out the less reactive and replace it so instead of having zinc and copper sulfate now i have zinc sulfate and copper remember that copper sulfate is what color blue solution so if i put zinc into blue copper sulfate what do i see what are the observations first of all the blue color of this uh, copper sulfate will become colorless because zinc sulfate is not a colored solution now also we put a piece of zinc solid i will see that the solid dis disappears or the zinc dissolves and i'm forming copper and you should know that the color of copper is reddish brown or red so this will be a red precipitate that is forming remember the word precipitate means a solid that forms in the reaction okay the same thing if i have magnesium plus copper carbonate and you should know that copper carbonate is green the magnesium is more reactive than copper so it will displace it and form magnesium carbonate now what is the color of the magnesium carbonate you should realize that magnesium carbonate is uh, a compound of group two and compounds of group two are not colored so magnesium carbonate is a colorless solution so that green solution becomes colorless and i will also find copper formed so i will have a red precipitate of copper deposit okay a typical sample question in an experiment a piece of zinc is placed in a beaker containing copper sulfate the reaction that occurs shows zinc is more reactive than copper state two observations again what were the two observations when we put zinc in copper sulfate we said well okay what is the color of copper sulfate it's blue so the blue solution will become colorless and the zinc metal will begin to dissolve or disappear okay if we talk about potential difference again potential difference we talked about it when we were talking about cells and we said if i put two metals in uh, a solution that conducts electricity like sulfuric acid the one of them is more reactive than the other so we said the one that is more reactive will give up electrons and become silver ion so it will dissolve the solution and give up electrons the electrons will move from the more elect uh, more uh, reactive metal to the less reactive metal so the electrons in this case will move from the zinc to the copper now this movement of electrons is called an electric current or it pro produces a potential difference okay how do i increase the potential difference or how do i increase the voltage of the current we said we put a metal that has bigger difference in reactivity so if i replace the zinc with magnesium there is a bigger difference in reactivity between magnesium and copper so uh, this will give a bigger voltage okay action of heat on so we have some compounds of metals and we're going to heat them and when we heat them they either break down or they do, they do not break down now breaking down of a compound with heat is called 
thermal decomposition. So thermal decomposition is what? The breakdown of a compound using heat. If a compound does not break down, we say that it is thermally stable. So we find that, okay, if we're talking about metal hydroxides, we will find out that hydroxides of group 1 are thermally stable. What do we mean? Hydroxides of group 1, when you heat them, they do not break down. So sodium hydroxide solid, if you start to heat it, nothing happens. The most that will happen is at some point you'll reach the melting point of the, of the solid and the solid will start to melt. But there is no reaction. It does not break up to form something else. But if we heat the hydroxide of any other metal, group 2 or transition or any other metal, heating uh, the hydroxide will give oxide plus water. So heating of copper hydroxide, for example, which you should know is a blue solution. Remember that most of the compounds of copper are blue except copper carbonate, which is green. So copper hydroxide is a blue solution. If I heat it, I'll start to see a black solid forming because the copper hydroxide is changing to copper oxide. Okay. Action of heat on carbonates. Okay. So Again, carbonates of group 1 are thermally stable. What did we mean by that? We said if we heat the sodium carbonate, for example, high, higher and higher and higher temperature, no reaction. It doesn't break up to form something else. The most that will happen is at some point you reach the melting point of the solid and the solid will start to melt. Okay? But carbonates of any other metal, so carbonates of group 2, or any other metal like copper carbonate. Copper carbonate, we, we said, is green. If you heat it, what does it form? It forms the oxide plus carbon dioxide. So copper oxide is a black solid. So the green solid will change to black solid and carbon dioxide gas is given off. Action of heat on metal nitrates. Now, Nitrates of group 1 are not thermally stable, but they behave in a different way from the nitrates of any other metal. So, for example, if I heat sodium nitrate, remember NO3 is nitrate, if I heat it, it gives me NaNO2. Now, NaNO2 is called sodium nitrite, NO2, with a compound is nitrite. So, the nitrate breaks down to form nitrite plus oxygen but nitrates of any other metal like copper nitrate and copper nitrate is a blue solution if i heat it what happens the copper nitrate changes into copper oxide so i will have a black solid forming at the bottom of the beaker and i will have a, a brown gas coming out this brown gas is no2 now no2 standing alone alone is not nitrite no2 is nitrogen dioxide so this is nitrogen dioxide gas, which is brown, given off in addition to oxygen gas. And please note the balancing of this equation because it comes a lot. Okay, what are alloys? We should say that alloys are mixtures of metals with other elements formed by mixing the molten metal together and then allowing them to cool. So, and if we're drawing metals, we said we draw them regular rows of positive ions with a sea of negative electrons, which we indicate by the minuses. But now, an alloy means we have different metals or a metal with other elements like carbon, for example. So that means that the atoms now are not the same uh, size. We have different sizes of atoms. So this is how we draw an alloy. Now, why do we use alloys in preference to other uh, to pure metals? Alloys are stronger and harder than pure metals. And if we say why are they stronger and harder? Because the presence of atoms of different sizes prevents the layers of positive ions from sliding over each other easily. Remember that we were saying why are metals malleable and ductile? They are malleable and ductile because layers of positive ions can slide over each other when heated or hammered. Now we are putting different atoms of different sizes. Now this causes the layers of positive ions not to slide over each other easily. Okay, what are, are the examples of alloys that we should know? We should know alloys of iron and iron alloys of copper. So alloys of iron are mild steel and stainless steel. Remember that mild steel and stainless steel 
Both of them contain iron plus carbon. Now, stainless steel has iron plus carbon plus other metals such as nickel and chromium. What do we use these for? Well, mild steel is used in car bodies, so the body of the car is made of mild steel. We use it in machinery, so machines are made of mild steel. What do we use stainless steel for? We use them for chemical plants. Chemical plants means factories that make chemicals, so that's a chemical plant. Now, we also use it to make cutlery. Cutlery are the spoon and fork and knife that we use to eat. Okay, so these are all alloys of iron. Now, the alloys of copper are either brass or bronze. Both of them contain copper, but brass is made of copper plus zinc, while bronze is made from copper plus tin. You're supposed to know all of this. Now, what do we use these for? What do we use brass for? We use it to make ornaments. Do you know the meaning of ornaments? Ornaments are small things that we put that give uh, that look nice and we just um, <clears throat> use it for decoration. So some ornaments are made of brass and we also use brass to make the buttons of the soldier's uniform because they are bright yellow so they, they're used to make buttons. Bronze can also be used for ornaments so things that look beautiful and we just decorate with it and we use it to make coins so most of many of the coins are made of bronze sample question which metal is commonly used to form alloys with a non-metallic element which of the alloys did we talk about had a non-metal in it remember the alloy of of what were the alloys of copper we did not talk about alloys of magnesium or zinc so it's not COD what are the alloys of copper the alloys of copper are brass and bronze, and we said brass contains copper plus what, do you remember? Copper plus zinc, and bronze contains copper plus tin. So th these are all metals, it doesn't have an unmetal. But what are the alloys of iron? We said the alloys of iron are called steel, and steel is mainly iron plus, iron plus carbon. Okay, uses of aluminium. What do we use aluminium for? Aluminium actually is used to make many things. So one of the things is food containers. Now, why do we use it for food containers? What is the property that it has that allows it to be used for food containers? Remember that aluminium resists corrosion. And by the way, if we say why aluminium resists corrosion and aluminium, remember, does not react with oxygen in the air. Why? Because it has a protective oxide layer. It usually forms an oxide layer that covers it and no more uh, aluminium reacts. So we say it forms a protective oxide layer. So aluminium resists corrosion. It is not poisonous. It does not react with food. So that's why we use it as food containers. What other use do, do we use it for? We use it to make aircraft bodies. Now, why do you think we use aluminium to make aircraft bodies? First of all, it has low density. It's a light metal, low density, and it is strong, so it can withstand pressure. So remember which properties we use or we um, choose to explain the use for something. So this, these are called overhead cables. Overhead cables are made of aluminium from outside. So why do we use aluminium for overhead cables? Because, first of all, they are light, low density, so uh, overhead cables are the electric wires that are in the street, so they need to be carried on poles, so if they're heavy, they will need more poles, which is more expensive. So aluminium has low density, and of course, the fact that it is a good conductor of electricity. We also use aluminium for cooking utensils. What are cooking utensils? The things that we cook in. Could, uh, this is because it is a good conductor of heat and does not react with food. Always relate the um, property needed for a certain use. Copper. What are the uses of copper? Well, we use copper in electric wires. So the wires that we have at home, inside it is made of copper. Now, why are they made of copper? Because copper is a good conductor of electricity and it is ductile. We also use copper for cooking utensils. So cooking utensils, this is not actually copper, but that's an example of a cooking utensil. So it is a good conductor of heat. 
Uh, we also make use it to make alloys. The alloys can be either bronze or brass. These were the alloys of copper that we talked about. Now, what do we use zinc for? We use it in galvanizing, and galvanizing is a method of protecting iron from corrosion. We will be talking about that in a minute. And we also use zinc uh, to make alloy with copper, and that is what forms brass. Okay, so you need to be able to compare between two important things, electric wire and overhead cables. What is the difference between the electric wire and the overhead cables? The electric wire has copper from inside and plastic cover from outside. Now, why do we have copper? We said because copper is a good conductor of electricity and it is ductile. Now, why do we cover it with plastic or we cover it with polymers? So when we're talking about polymers in organic, the electric wire is covered with a polymer or plastic. Why? Because it is an insulator and because it is unreactive, so it will not react with oxygen. It will not corrode like uh, metals do, for example. Okay, um, overhead cables. We said the overhead cables from outside, it's aluminum. And actually, within the aluminum, there is steel. Now, why would we put steel? We said we put steel to make it stronger. So we want the wires to be strong, not light and uh, hanging down and things like that. They have to be strong. And it is aluminium from outside because it's a good conductor of electricity and low density. Okay, rusting. Remember that rusting, when iron is exposed to what? To both water and oxygen. If iron is exposed to both water and oxygen, it will rust. Rust means it will react with the water and oxygen to form what we call hydrated iron 3 oxide. So what we call rust is actually hydrated iron 3 oxide. And is, as we see, it is a reddish brown and flaky substance. Flaky means it will peel off over time. So what is the appearance of rust? It is reddish brown and flaky. What is the formula of rust? It is Fe2O3x water because the, they could have different num amounts of water, 3 water, 5 water, things like that. So it is hydrated iron 3 oxide. And we said this is formed from the reaction of iron with what? Both water and oxygen. If one of them is missing, then the iron will not rust. For example, if we have this experiment in which we have nails in test tubes, the first nail is in distilled water. And you should know that distilled normal water or tap water, for example, will have uh, some oxygen dissolved in it. So this is actually water with oxygen dissolved in it. So if you leave the nails for a, about a week, remember that the minimum amount that we leave the nails for to determine if it has rusted or not is about five days. So leave it for five days, you'll find that the nails rust. Now, how do I know if the nails have rusted? Remember that we're starting with something that is iron and we're ending up with something that is iron oxide three water, for example. So the mass of the nail should increase. So remember, how do we compare rusting of the nails? We say the one that will have more increase in mass is the one that uh, has rusted more. Now, if we put the nails in boiled water, remember when you boil the water, the oxygen that is dissolved in it uh, is, is given off. So this is water that has no oxygen. And if I cover it with a layer of oil, then no more oxygen can dissolve in it. So this is a nail that, or these are nails that have water, but no oxygen. If it has water and no oxygen, it will not rust. Now, if I put it in a test tube that has anhydrous calcium chloride, now, Notice that anhydrous calcium chloride is something that absorbs water vapor from the air. So basically, this is a test tube that has oxygen because it has air, but no water. If you leave it like this, the nails will not rust. So the nails rust if they have both water and oxygen. But what if you put it in something like seawater? Or if you put it in acid, so seawater. Or acid, seawater is something that has salts. So put the nails in a water that has salts or acids, it will rust much faster than the normal nails. Okay? So, which substances are needed for iron to rust? We just said what? Water and oxygen. Good. To prevent rusting, if I don't want my iron to rust, the 
basic thing or the easiest thing to do is painting. When do I paint? If I have iron railings, so these things that we hold on when we're coming down the stairs, these are called railings or they are on the sides of bridges. So if I want to protect the iron railings from uh, rust, I just paint them. Also iron gates, we paint iron gates in order to prevent rusting. The other method would be coating with oil or grease. Now, when do we use that if we're talking about machines? So to prevent machines from rusting, we coat with oil or grease. Grease is a form of thick lubricant, thick oil. Okay, coating with plastic. When do we coat with plastic? If we're using, for example, dishwashers or dish racks. So you want you, you, you have the dishes on racks that have that are actually made of iron but they are covered with plastic now of course if the layer of plastic is removed then the iron below will start to rust okay another method is called galvanizing and galvanizing means covering the iron with a layer of zinc by dipping or spraying so we put the iron into liquid zinc or we spray it with zinc and that is called galvanizing so galvanizing is covering the iron with a layer of zinc by dipping or spraying now how does this protect the iron from uh, rusting the presence of the layer of zinc means that zinc is more reactive it will um, uh, lose electrons and become oxidized instead of the iron remember that rusting is an oxidation process for the iron, it gains oxygen. For something like the zinc, it will lose electrons. So if I have zinc covering the iron, then the zinc will lose electrons and become oxidized instead of the iron. And that means that if a part of the zinc is removed, the rest of the iron will still not rust. So long as the iron is touching zinc somewhere or it has some coat of zinc, then the iron will not rust. Okay? Sacrificial protection is a similar method, but in this case, we're not painting or dipping or spraying. We are uh, putting blocks of a more reactive metal next to the steel. For example, a ship is made of iron. Now, it would be very difficult to galvanize the whole ship or to um, uh, put a layer of zinc or something like that. So we just put a small block of, let's say, zinc or a small block of magnesium that is put on one side of the ship. And of course, so long as it is touching the iron of the ship, then the magnesium or the zinc will lose electrons and become oxidized instead of the iron until the whole bar of zinc or bar of magnesium is used up. Then that just, that bar is replaced then we are protecting the whole ship the other method that we talked about was electroplating and we said if i have a spoon and i cover it with silver why am i covering it with silver to protect from corrosion or from rusting so electroplating in which we cover the steel with a layer of less reactive metal like silver or nickel or chromium then it is covered with the silver or nickel or chromium and that does not rust so the whole spoon does not rust Okay, so let's take a look at the question. Which methods can be used to prevent the rusting of an iron girder of a bridge? Iron girder of a bridge is the iron uh, uh, parts of, the, of a bridge. So, can we coat it with grease? We said we coat with grease the things that are machines. So, we don't coat it with grease. We cannot electroplate it. We paint it. Okay? Recycling of metals. We say that it is a very good idea to recycle metals. What are the advantages? We save metal deposits. So metals are made from raw materials that we obtain from the earth. These raw materials are non-renewable. So if we recycle the metals, then we are saving the non-renewable resources. We are also saving the energy needed to manufacture and purify the metals. We avoid the effect of dumping a lot of metals on the environment since this is harmful to the ecosystem. The disadvantages of trying to recycle metals is usually collection and sorting of these uh, things to be recycled can be expensive or time consuming or require energy in some cases. So that's the end of metals. Uh, try the questions please and then go back and see the questions and answers in the next video.